human, the Homo sapien emergence from Africa and other parts of the world. As we talked about, maybe we could push this date back about 100,000 years because of the finds in Morocco. This date for dispersal into the what is now the Middle East or what we call the Middle East at 100,000 years ago is probably right, 70,000. And then we found this, this animal's cave art here which is at about 45,000 and they're hoping for even more, maybe like 65,000, because we might push the colonization, human expansion into Australia, I should say, at about 50 to 60,000 years ago, which we talked about as a pretty, pretty amazing that this, this could happen at all. And uh, you'll see here though, this is kind of an important date we might push this back 10,000 years or so, but 40,000 years, Homo sapiens coming into uh, what is now called Europe and the place where we'll be talking about where Neanderthals already were. And I want to talk a little bit about Australia here because this came up in a couple of your initial questions. How did people get to Australia? So this was a pretty early and fascinating human migration um, and pretty incredible that they were able to cross. I mean, there's obviously some intervening islands, but they were able to get into Australia and spread out through Australia. One of you also asked, well, why are the people in New Zealand, the indigenous people or the Maori, so different from the people in Australia, even though they are geographically close? And the answer to that is kind of interesting. For one thing, although it might look close to us on a world map, this is 1,200 miles of open sea. So actually the people who came to Australia, they figured Australia was enough, enough land for them. They didn't keep going across this open sea. It's a pretty hard voyage to make and they had already done, done so well. So the people who originally ended up in Australia actually didn't have a lot to do with the people who originally ended up in New Zealand. And this was actually the product of a much later and also super incredible human expansion migration, which was led by the Polynesians, which probably formed in this region around Indonesia, where we were studying in Papua New Guinea, and then did some incredible trans-Pacific voyages in order to settle places like Hawaii, places like Samoa, Cook Island, and also uh, New Zealand. And these are actually pretty recent settlements. So 1230 to 1280 AD are about 800 to uh, 800 years ago, more or less, um, that people first arrived in New Zealand, as I said, that they don't have much to do with the Aboriginal Australians who'd been there much longer um, and made it all the way out to, of course, Easter Island, where they erected those famous Easter Island heads. In this article, it's discussing the possibility of a connection between the Polynesians and people in South America. Um, and it seems like if there was a connection, there is evidence for some connection that it would have been from the Polynesians who'd already made it a long way and may have done these kinds of voyages as well. So this was a pretty incredible human expansion that I just wanted to mention because it came up in one of your questions about how people got to all these places. But yeah, even if you go to Hawaii, the original people there, about 800 800 years ago, native Hawaiians. All right, today, of course, we're turning to the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are named because they were first found in Neander Valley. That's a picture of Neander Valley I just found. Anybody ever, ever been there? What does it look like? Where do you think it is? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, I thought it was just down the road from here. It looks like a place I drove by to get to Hartwick College, I swear. But yes, you're correct. It is in Germany. It's a, the Neander Valley in Germany. And they were so named because they're found in the end, first found in, the, in this Neander Valley. And then they tacked on this word. Does anybody speak German? No German speakers. Does anybody know what that means? Yes. Huh? Oh, yeah, that's what you might expect, but it actually just means valley. So, <laughs> so this is, you know, but the thing is, this is old German. This is the old German orthography, which spelled this as kind of a soft T, but really a new German orthography, it's been revised to have a it sounds kind of like a soft T, but doesn't have as much H as we'd want to put into it. So for us English speakers. So they're originally called Neanderthals, but some people are starting to spell it using the new German spelling of Neanderthal. I thought all the cool people were using this new spelling, and so that's the way I spell it. But in our article for today, our author spells it with the H. So either way is fine. But it was just an interesting little little fact about how they got their name and what they what they came from. Now, at first, all the Europeans got really excited about these Neanderthals. They're like, yay, we found these ancient people in Germany. Look, it looks just like Germany. And here we found these fossils, and there are these. And so they started to talk about how the Neanderthals were. The descendants or you know the humans came from neanderthals but not too long after that they found those early modern homo sapiens from about 30,000 40,000 years ago doing the cave paintings and stuff and then they started to get down on the neanderthals they're like no these these guys are much cooler look they can do these cave paintings and they have all these artistic things and they look a lot more like us and so people figured out from fairly early on that the relationship between the neanderthals and humans was not a direct one and that actually homo sapiens emerged in africa there were some questions though about the interactions between these neanderthals and homo sapiens but people knew from a pretty early age that neanderthals were not directly ancestral to uh, to Homo sapiens. So, but they kind of took this a little too far, you might say. So as you saw in the article, there are some drawings of Neanderthals versus what they considered to be early modern humans. And so the Neanderthals are all stooped over and looking dumb and carrying sticks around. Whereas the early modern humans are basically doing a Picasso thing up there with their art and getting all cool and have fire and all the cool stuff. Now, this was directed, uh, the artist here is, is, was working under the direction of a person named Osborne. Well, James, you noticed something about these ideas. What were they, what were they based in, these ideas? Nothing. <laughs> based in nothing but what were what were the people into who were like promoting these ideas of separation between the neanderthals and the oh um it was based in ideas of like racism and stuff just like hierarchy of people that doesn't really pattern these kinds of debates right so it's based on this idea that there's you know these different different races or different species. And the people that were making these assertions were also against any sort of what they called interracial uh, stuff and trying to stop people from immigrating, et cetera. And so, yes, it was based on nothing, but uh, this was the, these were the ideas. And these ideas persist with us to the present day. Recently had the opportunity to play this game over the holidays. Anybody get to play this game? Pretty fun. It might be a good, you know, good Saturday night game. Can hit people with a stick if they use too many syllables in their words. I was not too good at this game, but uh, it's fun. 
but it you know it speaks to us of a of a long standing stereotype about neanderthals that they're dumb that they're brutes and if you call somebody a neanderthal that was an insult i don't know if this stereotype sticks i don't know if people are still using it but that was well it must stick a little bit because they have that game that i was just playing the other thing that it was happening is that the genetic evidence that was coming in when people first started to to analyze the human genome in the late 80s 1987 uh it basically there was no evidence that there had been interbreeding between neanderthals and homo sapiens and they couldn't find anything and so a lot of people were saying well obviously these are separate species there's no genetic evidence of interbreeding now some people there was a counter trend to this there were like some people who were still way into the neanderthals i'm not sure why i think mostly like the hippies and stuff they some of them said that they were like really these flowery wonderful people some of them said they were smarter than homo sapiens and that's why they you know because they actually technically had a larger cranium although you have to put that in relation to their larger body size and also different brain organization but people got really into them and said oh yeah well these bad homo sapiens came in and they killed off the neanderthals but the neanderthals were these peaceful people who you know did their flowers and were nice they were too nice too smart and too nice to survive and so some people still like them and there were other people who were like really including scientists who are like really into the idea that somehow the europeans and neanderthals had gotten together and mated with each other so they'd be going around and showing off their big noses and saying, yeah, this is like a Neanderthal nose and stuff like that. And it was all very strange. But what was even perhaps stranger is in 2010, there was a big surprise finding that showed us that if you did this super sophisticated genetic analysis, that it turns out that the Neanderthals did contribute to the modern human genome not a lot but some a decent amount and so you know i mean genetics is always very complicated but it showed that there was something going on there 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 was they were not ex, they were not actually separate species in fact they could interbreed and produce viable offspring so the the interesting thing about this though is that they figure that the interbreeding probably happened in that Middle Eastern area where Neanderthals also were and where they probably encountered Homo sapiens who were emerging from Africa. And so when they were sampling who had the most Neanderthal genes, it came not just from Europe, from a, but from across Eurasia. And in fact, some of the East Asian samples of course, again, genetics is complicated, so you have to be careful with this. But some of the East Asian samples in places like Japan, where they are not known for having big noses, seem to have higher Neanderthal percentages, not huge, but higher than even those in Europe. So this was kind of, again, for one thing, it was a big surprise. And the people who had been clinging to this idea were like, see, we were right. But they'd been clinging to the European idea they didn't really know about across Eurasia like this. Now, when these samples were drawn, I just want you to be careful of two incorrect ideas which are still circulating about this Neanderthal intermixture, but, um, but are false. So one of the ideas was that the Neanderthals only intermixed with Eurasians. And it is true that the African samples had less Neanderthal intermixture than the Eurasian samples, but it's not zero. They have some because, as we talked about, there's been continued migration into and out of Africa, and there's been lots of, there's continuing contact, and there, there always have been people intermixing, interbreeding, trading, etc. So 
there's probably less in many of the indigenous groups that are indigenous to Africa, but it's some. And I, and when we look around our lives, everybody that lives in the Americas, let's say the United States or in the Caribbean or in South America, all the people in the Americas, like African Americans in the United States, are likely to have similar levels of Neanderthal ancestry. And I say this because I have heard some people in this very classroom, professors who aren't here anymore, say things like, oh, if you're African American, you're not, you don't have the same Neanderthal levels. And that's not true. Um, it's probably pretty much the same. By the way, why is it that African Americans are likely to have pretty much the same level of Neanderthal ancestry genetically as? European Americans. We'll be reading about this pretty soon when we read a few chapters from how the word is passed. And we'll be reading about Monticello. Anybody ever heard of Monticello? Yeah. The place where Thomas Jefferson was. So Thomas Jefferson, very famously or infamously, had offspring with a person who was Sally Hemings, who was enslaved, and they had several offspring. And this was not not at all uncommon on uh, on U.S. and other plantations in the Americas. It was actually pretty. How to say the systematic rape of female slaves, enslaved Africans was a ingredient, was a crucial ingredient of the whole system of slavery. And so when we talk about Europeans and Africans, a lot of people who think of themselves as white or who think of themselves as black actually come from a, a more genetically mixed heritage. And there's actually people from the Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings line who later became more classified as white and others who later became more classified as black, but genetically speaking, they're, they're all kind of mixed up. Anyway, we'll be reading about that later, but I just wanted to mention it here. Like I said, I want us to be careful when everybody, anybody ever says anything about genetics and who has Neanderthal ancestry and et cetera, you have to watch out. And one of the reasons is, is now that we know that, you know, Neanderthals and and modern Homo sapiens interbred, everybody's like, oh yeah, those Neanderthals, they were pretty smart. They were pretty artistic. They, you know, they must uh, they must be smart because look, you know, because you don't want to have be interbreeding with dumb people, right? So you only only want to be interbreeding with the smart people out there. So now there's this kind of counter trend to portray them as as very smart and artistic. However, there are how to say. There's skeptics. There's people who are, well, Eric, who are the skeptics? What do they say about this whenever anybody says Neanderthal art? What's their what's their back back claim? Well, what would you say if I came out with something cool and I said a Neanderthal made this? Right? <laughs> would you believe me? There's not much. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of skeptics who are like, no, nah, they didn't make it. And they also say that, oh, they must have learned that from the Homo sapiens, right? They say, well, hey, those Neanderthals, they were doing their thing. And then the smarter Homo sapiens came in and they were just copying what they were doing. And so there are always have been skeptics, right? But so what people are in some ways looking for when they look for Neanderthal art 
is something that would be happening before about, let's say, 50,000 years ago. Because if you can get evidence of something before 50,000 years ago, then you're pretty sure that the Homo sapiens weren't around yet. And so it seems to be maybe the Neanderthals were doing this independently. Of course, Tyler, what's the problem with trying to get any evidence of anything that happened more than 50,000 years ago? <laughs> it's all gone. We talked about in the last class how evidence of art is actually, most evidence of art is probably not, not in existence at all, and a lot of it has gone away. So it's very difficult to get evidence. And Kendra, even if we have evidence of cave art, and you're like looking at the art and you're trying to figure out when was this made? What's the problem? I'm trying to figure out this thing. I want a date for it. It's like I have a painting and I say, give me a date. Is that easy to do? Oh, no, it's very hard to do. It's extremely hard to date anything before 50,000 years ago because you can't use radiocarbon dating on anything that old. And so basically people just assume it's younger than that. Now, Alexa, they did come up with a new thing using, using funny uranium stuff, right? What'd they do? Well, yeah it was really it was really complicated and kind of cool but yeah you use this uranium thorium dating method and you're looking at the calcites that are coming out of this thing and if you know those calcites are older than the pigment then you have sort of a minimum age and so some people say this art some of this cave art is dating to sixty-five thousand years ago Oh, right. This is not the animal cave art, by the way. That's still over in Indonesia. This is other stuff like hand flutes, which we'll talk about on Monday. Now, there's some people who say this is still in question. Some of these dating methods are a little bit controversial. And people are like, no, uranium, uranium doesn't move that fast in groundwater. So there's still some question about this. Now, there's perhaps... This perhaps is better for us, right, Phil? What's that? A, yeah, a stalagmite stone circle. Well, I don't know, probably. Yeah. So it looks like they took these stalagmites in the cave and arranged them in circles, maybe even used fire in this cave. At, 176,500 years ago, which is a pretty precise date, let's say 170,000 about to be sure, but this would be long before we, long before Homo sapiens showed up to teach them anything. So it's kind of, it's kind of a cool thing that predates Homo sapiens. And then we have these things. What are these, Jalen? You said this was nasty, which I was curious about. <laughs> Why you say these things are nasty. <laughs> Diane, did you think this was nasty to wear an animal bone around your neck? What would you say? As long as they're clean. <laughs> as long as they're clean. Doesn't much of our, I'm trying to think, people wear jewelry from manable bones, right? Still, that's a thing. That, oh, yeah. Those are cool. They're not nasty. Yeah. You literally carve bone beads all the time. You've done it. See, Jalen? It's not nasty. Just fine. <laughs> Maybe you didn't like the feathers. Yeah. Oh, you're not into the feathers. Nobody wears feathers anymore. 
drag queens. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, the article title where I got this picture from said that Neanderthal jewelry is just as fiercely cool as you'd imagine, like some kind of prehistoric punk rockers. So there you go. Appropriating the nasty feathers and talons and stuff. So anyway, there's pretty good evidence for Neanderthal art. A lot of it has disappeared. It looks like the Homo sapiens didn't teach them that. I don't want to get too into whether Neanderthals were smart or dumb. I think those questions are kind of misguided and people get, people make some crazy claims about intelligence and these kinds of things. There are lots of different creatures who do, who do cool things with bones and other, other materials and 